Hello, friends of Rover, Rover lovers, Rover enthusiasts. Forget about MG because they're still about. A subject of conversation for a very long time is the demise of Rover. It's contentious, it's divisive, it's... Why did MG Rover disappear? Well, why? Yeah. Why did it? Who's to blame? Well, there's um, plenty of opinions on this. Plenty of conflicting opinions. And I'm going to give you my opinion because it might be one that you haven't thought of. Was BMW to blame? Or was it the Phoenix 4? Or was it Honda? Or was it British Aerospace? Or was it the British government? Just in case you didn't know, Rover were a nice company making nice cars for nice British people. And then something happened. In general, Rover people don't like BMW. They're seen as being arrogant and just bad, impatient drivers. The BMW stereotype does have its roots in some of their bad behaviour. And it's not usually the kind of thing you would find a rover driver doing. But that's not the point. So what is the point then? Well, actually, BMW did quite a bit to help Rover. I mean, they bought them in the first place. They put an awful lot of money into that BRM suspension. They put the money into the Rover 75 design and the Mini as well. There were many a conflict to be had, of course. But is it really their fault? If a big company like BMW couldn't save Rover, probably nobody could. BMW has money. It has influence. It has many things. But what it didn't have was a front-wheel drive car. The 75 was basically their first go of making a front-wheel drive car before they did the Mini. And there are, of course, many an argument that say that the Rover 75 was made deliberately so it couldn't compete against the BMW. But then again, the person who drives a 75 isn't likely to even want a BMW. BMW people want BMWs. Rover people want Rovers. But they most definitely did want Mini. And look what they've done with Mini. Look at how many cars Mini have now called Mini. Mini was certainly a huge marketing success. Like them or not, they've done well for themselves. So the theory goes that BMW bought Rover just so they could get their hands on Mini. And is that possible? Well, it does seem a bit strange really that a company like BMW would buy this failing company and not know that it was going to fail even further. It all seems a little bit unfair to blame a company like BMW for Rover's demise when they put so much money into it. In fact, they even gave 500 million pound to the Phoenix Consortium when they sold it to them for a tenner. But why did they buy them in the first place? If it wasn't just for Mini, why would they do it? They could clearly see that they weren't going to succeed with the way things were going. And you'd imagine a company like BMW would be able to predict its future a bit better than it did. Previously, Rover were you know, in a relationship with Honda. And it was a mostly nice relationship, but it was starting to go a bit sour. Then in 1994, BMW coughed up 800 million, I think it was, for 80% of Rover. And it all looked like a great idea. Honda, on the other hand, weren't too keen. And they basically took the dummy out of the pram. The general opinion is that Rover's build quality start to go downhill right from the moment BMW took over. They wanted to make the company more profitable. But of course, Rover was a premium brand. And if you look at any of their cars at the time, the 200, the 400, the 600, the 800, they were all fantastically made cars. So when BMW finally decided they couldn't do anything with Rover, it was an unprofitable company, straight after they took Mini, they sold it. And the Phoenix Consortium were the buyers. And that was properly 
the start of the demise. But was it the actual cause? Well, partly. The Phoenix Four were four men who bought Rover for £10. That is, um, let me calculator out. Two pounds fifty each, and within the deal, they were given or loaned five hundred million to invest in the company and make sure that the workers had a fair deal. Did they have a fair deal, though? I mean, obviously, they all ended up being made redundant in the end. But what about the Project Drive initiative? That was the initiative where employers were paid, were given sweetness, beer tokens, whatever, for coming up with ideas on how they can save the company money by basically taking bits off the cars that were on there that would cost pennies. If you didn't know, the Phoenix Consortium basically stripped Rover down to nothing in the end. They sold cars that were made more cheaply for the same price. They tried to rip the general public off with a Rover City Rover thingy. They come up with some ideas that were nonsense. And uh, the irony of the whole thing is that name, Phoenix. There is such a thing as the Phoenix company fraud. Companies can go into liquidation, fraud, bankruptcy, all this kind of thing can happen. Yet the directors come off scot-free and can just start again. So they take everything that the original company had, put it somewhere else. Rising from the ashes like a phoenix, so to speak. Weird that, isn't it? I could go a bit further into this and try and do some research on what's happened to these four men that went away rich whilst Rover died. But I'm not interested in that, because I don't even think they're entirely to blame. This might not be what you expect, but I partly blame MG for the demise of Rover. Although MG made many, many credit-worthy sports cars in the 60s, they were not really the same as Rover, were they? They did a few sporty versions of Leyland cars, but then to do it on the whole range of Rover cars, I think somewhat... Mm. Mm. What's the word? Chaved up Rover. Some people think that the MG variants of Rovers are nothing more than a, a sporty version of that car. With an expensive pair of trainers and a branded t-shirt. But it's not. There's actually a lot more to it than that. It's more than just different wheels and different paint colours and different front bumpers and boot spoilers and being a bit lowered and having the different suspension but the interiors are different steering racks are different there's all sorts of subtle changes that make the MG ZR for example feel like a completely different car to the 25. The ZR, the ZS and the ZT were all brilliant cars they handled fantastically but they're much better on a racetrack or a smooth road when it comes to just normal driving around they're horrible. They're just not comfortable. The wheels are too big. The suspension's too hard. And the traditional Rover buyer is, well, maybe a little bit older and frailer than your typical BMW driver. I'm in enough pain as it is with my knees and my hips and everything else. I don't really want to be uncomfortable while I'm driving as well. Some will blame journalists, Top Gear, for example, for what they did. Yeah, they did it. They really did slate Rover quite a lot. But that was only after BMW had already taken them over. In fact, most of their slating happened after BMW had sold them. All the likes of Clarkson did was just basically give his opinion on it. And he's allowed to do that. Like him or not, that's really his job. Go back to 1989 when the R8 first came out. It was basically outclassing the BMW. And Top Gear even said as much. Yes, the journalists used to you know, love Rover, with good reason. And then they stopped loving them once they started becoming not as lovable. But why? Why did they start cutting corners in the first place? Why did they make these really nice cars for really nice people into something a bit cheapened? Well, the simple answer is, I don't know actually. Why did they do that? Because they were selling loads of them. 
the R8 sold loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of cars. They just wasn't particularly fashionable. The only car companies that could keep up with the build quality were Honda and Toyota and Mercedes at the time. BMW couldn't. Honda could, but they didn't have the class. They were like a cheap Rover, if anybody remembers that. Then suddenly Honda started to make cars that were appealing to younger people a bit more. And then their credibility went up, whereas Rovers went down. Shall I tell you who I blame more than anyone though? The great British public. Yeah. The great British public for patriotically buying a BMW. For giving up on the British car industry. For the unions and all of that lazy attitude that we had towards building cars in the first place. For falling for this American attitude that everything's somebody else's fault. And no longer can we fix things, we have to just shut them away and buy new and buy foreign. Because we believe they do a better job of it than what we do. Patriotism. Somehow a thing to be embarrassed by. No longer can we have patriotism because it gets confused with something else. Brits, losing your individuality, going for fashion rather than free thinking. The time has long gone where the roads are full of British cars and partly that is down to nobody believing in themselves any longer. Gradually and surely we seem to have given up on being British and we don't want things that identify us as being British any longer. Instead, what we prefer to do is pay someone else. It's like, it's like the whole collapse of the corner shop. Supporting local business taken over by supermarkets because we believe that they do it better. But what they do is they do it ever so slightly cheaper, but not any better at all. And we fall for it. So it's everybody's fault. Except mine.